Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. I'm Ash Bennington. Once again, it's TG Tuesday. Tony Greer is with us, founder of TG Macro and the Morning Navigator. Let's take a quick look at what's happening in the news. It's an active day in markets. Lots of all-time highs to cover. We're going to look at a number of things here that are happening today uh, in the broader economy, in finance, and in markets talking about energy, talking about inflation, supply chain woes, of course, the Fed meeting tomorrow. And once again, the strong earnings season continues. Let's take a quick look at equity markets. Looks like we've got all-time highs right now on the S&P 500, uh, closing out the day at 4,630, uh, up about a third of a percent on the day. Dow Jones Industrial Average also notching all-time highs, 36,000. 53. And hey, by the way, while we're talking about markets, let's take a look at what's happening in the digital asset space. Bitcoin at 63,471. And once again, in Ethereum, it's ATH, ETH, all time high on Ether. Looks like 4,500 or thereabout right now. Let's bring Tony Greer into the conversation. Tony, always a pleasure to be with you. Welcome back. Slash Bennington, what do you say, my man? How are you? Oh, man, I'm great, man. Just got back from the NFT.NYC conference, the uh, non-fungible tokens conference down in Times Square. Uh, tell me about that. Give me some color. What's the story? I mean, obviously, that rhymes with um, Ethereum flying off our screens today. What's going on over there? Yeah, probably not a coincidence. Most of these NFTs uh, are hosted on the Ethereum network, ultimately, although some are moving uh, over to Solana. And there's talk about Cardano as well. Look, Tony, it's a surreal scene, incredible enthusiasm, amazing energy around this. You and I have both been to a lot of financial conferences. I went and registered yesterday for NFT.NYC. There was a line of people around the block, and they were cheering as they waited in line outside. That's the level of enthusiasm that's happening in this space right now. And that's tough to contend with. You know, I mean, that's that's a... Uh... That looks to me like growing positive sentiment rather than something that's about to flame out. It really does. Yeah, and I would probably add to that. What it says to me is there's end user demand for this. These aren't people who are just investors. These are people who are passionate about the space. Uh, you know, ordinary guys and gals uh, who are not necessarily uh, people who are, you know, especially interested in financial markets. I've met artists. Uh, I've met people who are just passionate about collectibles. There are a lot of dots we can connect on this one, Tony, as we think it through. Yeah, for sure, Ash. I mean, it, it, it uh, you know, it's rhyming for me. It's rhyming with the macro scenario for you. There are, you know, you're, you're seeing the on the ground, um, you know, interest, if we can call it that, right? The people that actually care that have maybe come from other industries and are like, I'm going to that NFT conference in New York because right. probably because they've been trading them, probably because maybe they've been investing them, want to invest in them. But I think the most important thing is that uh, more and more people are, you know, going to be pivoting towards adoption and seeing the light and a little bit of how, you know, I, I think it really, really helped this month as I go over my notes that, you know, let the record reflect that in the month of October, when we saw headline inflation kind of go vertical across the screens and we had Paul Trudeau Jones on, you know, backing Bitcoin as a better inflation hedge than gold. That was the best about the best cryptocurrency commercial as the markets could have put on in the last month. So it's really not shocking to me to see this follow through here, um, Ethereum breaking out, et cetera, et cetera. And I love hearing your, um, you know, more on the ground applications of it, as that's what I got from a call that I had with a client today. And this is a guy that doesn't really believe that that Bitcoin is really going to survive in the long run. But he looks at it as like, well, let's ride the wave now. You know, there are a lot of direct applications to this that may outlast the cryptocurrency itself and ways to invest. So I think that's really interesting. And man, it's a brave new world. Our man Raul has been way ahead of it. So that's very interesting. Yeah, you're not kidding. And we can break that down a little bit more maybe later in the show. But first, I want to get to what's on your mind, Tony. Some of the points that I touched on, uh, energy markets, supply chains, labor markets, all of these headwinds, structural headwinds facing uh, the broader economy right now uh, and how they relate to what you're seeing in terms of the tail of the tape. What are you looking at, Tony? Yeah, as you know, you nailed it with, um, you know, stocks on the highs and breakouts happening, breakouts galore. You know, I wrote that note two weeks ago called Breakouts Win, and that really expressed my sentiment. And I'm thrilled that it's manifesting on the screens now. You know, when in terms of breakouts, let's just look at the fact that while we've got the S&P carving new highs today, We've got breakouts in semiconductors to a new all-time high, um, a big rally in basic materials, 
um, you know, which only rallied 8% in October. But now we're seeing breakouts in names like Martin Marietta and Vulcan Materials and DuPont, names that are having large magnitude extensions either to new highs or through moving average resistance levels. And that is a really powerful cocktail for the stock market, Ash. And there's a lot more that we can go into um, in terms of commodities, bonds, and everything like that. But the way the stock market is behaving, um, with the rotation being a very healthy rotation, both on a daily and weekly basis, where it might be the energy sector out in front this week, it might be metals and mining next week. And most importantly, you know, one of the big tells from October was that um, technology stocks can rally in a rising rate environment. And that's something that probably a lot of portfolio managers may not have been counting on. Um, but with Tesla catching fire and semiconductors catching fire um, and software really carving new highs behind Microsoft, which seems to make a new high every day, um, the technology so sector is alive and well. It's going to be part of this inflation trade. Um, and that's something that's really interesting. You know, we've been we've had the natural resources side nailed. And as I expand my horizons a little bit um, today, I leveled in and zeroed in on the ag trade being really important with that Glasgow um, event in the background. But it's, you know, with with technology and Bitcoin and Ethereum making new highs all the time, you really can't rule that out either. So it's kind of me. It's a matter of kind of you know, making sure you've got the market covered and sort of hedging your inflation bets, if I may, at this point. Yeah, that's very well said and a very broad based uh, analysis of what's happening. Tony, let's do this. Let me throw something out to you. How the things that I've been struggling with, how I've been trying to see these markets, and then maybe you can frame it up in terms of the context of the thesis that you just laid out, which is very comprehensive. So I look at broader uh, economic signals and we're, we're the same thing we've been talking about here, right? Challenges with dislocations in the labor market, inflation, especially uh, on the energy side, uh, and, and significantly disrupted global supply chains. So we got that component. Now, uh, here we are, obviously, Fed meeting today, news conference tomorrow at the end of the two-day meeting. Uh, and what we're hearing, at least uh, around the financial chatter circles of the world, is a growing consensus that the Fed may begin the taper in November to uh, begin to withdraw some of that extraordinarily accommodative monetary policy, reducing the rate at which they are buying treasuries and agency debt uh, a little bit at the margin, a few billion here or there. Uh, the other question I have is we tee all this up, we look at this broad context, U.S. equity markets absolutely on fire, risk assets in general absolutely on fire. We see that on the digital asset slash crypto side. How do you sort of square the circle? How do you put that all together? Significant macroeconomic headwinds, withdrawing accommodation from the Fed simultaneously, all-time highs. And by the way, as I think I mentioned at the opening, rip and earnings once again. How do we balance all those different threads out? First of all, I love it when you say square the circle, Ash. That really puts things in perspective for me. Now I know what, now I know what I need to do here. Uh, no, I'm joking because I love that expression. Uh, I have to say the Fed conversation is important, right? Um, I think that you nailed it with de minimis tapering. I think that that's probably the market is is probably calling the Federal Reserve's hand right now and saying, okay, we know you're going to maybe taper, but maybe you go from 120 to 100 billion a month. We've got a few clues as to what the tapering means. It sounds like it's got a finite, um, you know, term on it. And I'm not sure if that's what the market's focusing on anymore. I feel like they're looking past that, like you say, to those supply chain um, right. kinks and tightness that look like they're going to be persistent. You know, I read a really interesting thread, um, and no, excuse me, it wasn't a thread, it was a Substack post by a truck driver, a 20-year veteran of the trucking industry, that, you know, made a really good case for this supply shortage being with us for a really long time. Because what happens is in some of these businesses, in the cargo business, in the trucking business, all the delay means is that some of these companies can get paid for doing nothing, right? They charge late fees on either their equipment, their containers, their ships, whatever it is, being out at sea, being on the road, waiting to dock, waiting to port. And they kick back and they add another pad into their earnings because people are going to have to pay for the delays. So um, it's interesting to see that that translates into the stock market. Right. And to balance off why the stock market white might be continuing to rally through that is, you know, a quick look at the month of October. You know, we had um, in October, we had transport, software, consumer discretionary stocks breaking out to the upside. 
We had the NASDAQ outpacing the Dow Jones. Um, you know, a lot of things are going right for the stock market right now because this inflationary read through is still pass offable to the client and pass offable to the customer or corporate who's paying the bill. So I think that that speaks to what's going on in the stock market, you know, and that transport rally, by the way, took place with the airlines going down on the month. So that was largely a trucker and rail rally, which is what you would expect to see given the situation around the world them putting their um, pricing that into earnings, earnings beating and the stocks taking off. So um, the Fed dynamic, Ash, to go back to that for a minute, I think that more of what the market is being concerned with, and I don't know if this is a fair uh, assessment of the whole market or just a good sample of the TG macro client base. My Slack channel has been talking a lot more about, hey guys, Powell's done. What is our read through here if, you know, and even on Twitter, the conversation has morphed to that quite a bit. But what's the read through here if we get a Fed chair that's all into MMT, right? And if you look at the markets, you go, whoa, that might explain things, right? That's a little bit different thought than we're tapering and the market can stand it anyway because there's enough inflation out there, right? So, you know, I'm being careful about what the Fed is signaling and what they're doing. Right. They've been saying we're trying to get inflation to catch on for years now, and now we finally got it. So I doubt that they're going to come out and just jam the genie back in the bottle. They know that's very difficult slash impossible to do. So I think they're going to try to manage this from a verbiage perspective and from, a, you know, with that tapered perspective to maybe try to keep things from getting out of control. Let the market not think that there is abundant liquidity around every corner on every opening and maybe right. the markets cool off. I don't know. That doesn't seem to be happening. Base metals markets cooled off. And now this month, you've got oil markets, grain markets taking off and making new highs. So, you know, that, that's why I'm pivoting into um, ag being a great trade, especially to fade the buffoons in Glasgow right now. And all of that is part of the inflation. You know, that, that's, a, you know, a lot of that policy we have to just mention is guiding this inflationary move in the market. So, you know, it's just important to kind of keep that um, that circus in, a, in our um, peripheral vision and understand what's going on over there. That is a big driver of what's going on here as much as the Fed's balance sheet going from $4 trillion to $8 trillion in one fell swoop. Yeah, you know, so many important points there. I don't know where to start. Uh, Me neither. You know, <laughs> Let's just break it down, Ash. It's really interesting. We, t we talk about the challenges with supply chains. This is, and you mentioned the, the truck driver on writing on Substack. It's fascinating to me to see uh, that and I don't want to do too much of a victory lap here because Real Vision was early to this. You and I have been early to talking about this conversation. But it was fascinating to me that many of, many of my friends uh, who were small business people were coming to me before you started reading these stories in some of the mainstream financial press saying, dude, there's something seriously wrong. I can't get supplies. I got jobs that I can't do because I can't get electrical equipment. I got jobs that I can't do because I can't get X, Y, Z. Really interesting. Uh, moment to see this and to look and see how the micro uh, wraps up into the macro here. Well, that reason was morphing ash over the last year, and I think that's why it's so hard to follow. You know, we had that we had the obvious lockdowns that that flat out probably shut down manufacturing in certain places of the world, um, and you know that causes a huge backup just from the normal everyday business flow of people buying cars and appliances and things like that. So at first it was the COVID lockdown excuse, and then it became, look at all those tankers floating around out there that can't get into their port. Um, you know, it may have morphed into the, you know, the people at the ports not getting vaccinated, not showing up for work, whatever it is, that becoming part of the choke off story, and then kind of nothing changing for a while as, you know, the admin tries to warn us about the holidays and that we're going into the most expensive Thanksgiving dinner, like, you know, seeing the most inflationist Thanksgiving dinner than any other year in history. Um, you know, they're talking about, you know, the, the media wants you afraid that Christmas isn't going to happen as if it takes place, you know, around getting gifts and not around God. But we can keep going right through that. And so, you know, the markets here, there's no alternative still, right? It's still look at the stock market, look at the performance there, look at Bitcoin, look at the performance there. As the inflation story picks up steam, those are the securities that are picking up steam, and that's what price action is telling us where to be. Yeah, you know, talking exactly of that, I wanted to show a clip here. This is Larry McDonald uh, talking to uh, John Champaglia, uh, CEO of Sprott Asset Management, very much on point with exactly what you were just saying. 
Let's take a look at the clip. The supply response is not quick. Uh, it's not like you just turn a handle and the oil starts coming out of a pipeline. The supply response will take years. If you have a mine that's on care and maintenance and you said tomorrow, okay, I'm going to turn it back on, you think about trying to, to find and train sometimes a thousand different people to work at a mine in a remote location. It could take two years to get it back to production. So these things take a very long time. And I think that's one of the issues that you face with any commodity market that's small uh, and, and where the, the commodity is critical. Uh, is that sometimes you have these supply shocks, sometimes you have these price levels that overshoot. And I think a lot of investors believe that we could have this ongoing supply crunch until that incentive price is reached. That's the thesis that a lot of institutional investors have kind of echoed back to me. There you go, I have it, John Champaglia. I thought, Tony, the most striking part of that was something that he said very early on in the clip, which is, quote, the supply response is not quick. It's not like you just turn a handle and oil starts coming out of a pipeline. The supply response will take years. Those are some sort of sobering thoughts on continuing challenges that we have in the supply chain. You know what that reminds me of, Ash? That's a great, uh, that's a great link to sort of um, rig count, uh, you know, in terms of how long it takes to get supply to come back on. It took us from basically 2007 to 2015 to get rig count from 200 to 1,600 rigs out in the Gulf, right? So that's an eight bagger that took about, you know, eight years. It took one year to get that rig count down to 600, right? So rig count got cut in half in one year right. after, you know what I mean? It's kind of one of those, another commodity story where they sort of take the escalator up and the elevator down. The escalator up is to Larry's point. It takes a long time to get production back on and get drills up, oh, excuse me, drills in the ground, rigs up and running. I mean, that's a major operation. Yeah, it's almost like taking the stairs up and getting thrown off the roof on the way down. <laughs> exactly what it's like, exactly. And by the like. way, you know, for those who may not know, Tony, when you talk about this particular aspect of the space, this is something that you traded at Goldman Sachs. You were very much watching this at a very granular level for many, many years. Yeah, that's why it's fun now to have a much better understanding, um, a lot more experience, um, a much uh, a, a much valued education in trading these things. You know, it took a while of stumbling around the oil markets, you know, in the dark, quite literally, and just kind of listening and absorbing what's going on until you can figure out your own methods of following the markets that you find are effective and, you know, develop your network that you find keeps you plugged in well enough to that market. Um, you know, it's all about those building blocks that go into it over the years. And it just it just so happens, Ash, you know, it's a great testament to sitting in the student's chair and learning all of that for those years, because yeah. then you get an opportunity like the lockdown and oil goes to zero and you say, I know what to do in this scenario. And it all adds up so that that uh, that education was paid for, but it wound up paying off, which is a good story. Finally. Yeah, definitely. There were days where a uh, zero oil price would have been uh, bullish, I guess, when we were trading negative there. Um, you know, real quick, I just wanted to give a, a bit of a framework here. You know, the interesting thing about RVDB, of course, is that we have people who come to us at, at all different points in their journey, people who are just getting started uh, to people who are very experienced with markets. Uh, you and I are still also on this journey, but I wanted to frame this up a little bit uh, because there's a lot of talk about what's happening right now with the taper and what that means. So I just wanted to give a little bit of color around it for people who are relatively new to the space. So you have several different policy mechanisms that the Fed has in place, the most important of which uh, during normal times is the is the uh, reserve rate window, the target, the federal uh, funds rate target that the Fed starts. That's between zero and 25 basis points. That's zero and a quarter of a percent. That's effectively at the zero bound. When you reach the zero bound uh, and there's nowhere further to go below that, the Fed began to expand the balance sheet. We're now at about eight and a half trillion dollars uh, off of uh, a low of something like around 300 or so billion uh, prior to uh, the global financial crisis. I'm sorry, I stand corrected. $750 billion, it looks like, below the, at the global financial crisis. But it, the point here is this has been a dramatic increase. The taper is just reducing the rate of the increase. What that basically means, if you want a really silly metaphor to look at it, it's like, Tony, you lend me $100,000 to make a down payment on the house, right? And then after that, you start lending me $1,000 a month to make mortgage payments. And one day you pick up the phone and you call me and you say, Ash, I'm getting tough with you. 
there's a taper. I'm only lending you 800 new dollars per month going forward, just to get a sense of how accommodative this policy is right now. Now, that's a great way of putting it, right? So what, what they're doing is laying off the gas, right? They want, to, they want to frame it in the media like, you know, it's a major controversial step, you know, like the Fed is maybe coming to grips with years of profligacy and they're going to start to, you know, do the right thing now. And I think that that's actually how they want it to come across the tape to the general public. And you know how they want it to come across the tape to the financial markets. They want it to come across the tape as a tightening so things can kind of have a more measured pace and they can keep the media off their back. You know what I mean? Everything is about rate of change. So it was very clear earlier on that Jerome Powell was going to get blown out of the water with his transitory call. And they've adjusted for that now. They've certainly adjusted for the transitory call, right, by saying we're going to address this inflation with the tapering. The reality is, you know, they're tapering this much because the inflation is still very important to their reflation story. And, you know, that's the only way that they're going to get the markets to remain on their feet is to continue yeah. to build this credibility into it. And, you know, so far, so good. Maybe it works. You know, there's going to have to be an end game to this entire balance sheet expansion at some point. And if they can first start by tapering the purchases, maybe it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, extremely well said, spot on. And I would only add to that, you know, part of the challenge here, uh, and for people who are not sort of very closely following central bank policies, the Fed has a dual mandate. Basically, that's talking about stable prices and maximum employment. Those are the two sort of Scylla and Charybdis that the Fed needs to thread its way between, right? So we have this challenge now where we have inflation rising, and yet simultaneously, simultaneously, we're seeing the most recent prints uh, being the worst uh, of the recovery in terms of new job growth, 190,000 jobs added on the last employment report. Uh, that is significantly below trend, meaning it's below the trajectory of where we should be with job replacement. So you've got the Fed now trapped between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they're supposed to have stable prices. On the other, they're supposed to maximize employment. Unfortunately, the policy tools that they're employing, you know, you have to pick one or the other. And the risk is they both go off sides at the same time. And then where are we? Man, that's a good point, Ash. You know, that's a real eye opener, hopefully, for, for uh, people listening. Um, it does, while it does feel like they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, it has felt like that before. True. Okay. So, you know, and then that's all I want to say because I kind of I, I spent the last 25 years of my career thinking the Fed was screwed, right? And, and it seems like, you know, they, fin they manage with, with the control of money supply, you work your way out of a lot of problems. So, you know, I, I, it's not to say that um, they're going to be able to put on the brakes with their accommodation, um, but I, I like the way you're looking at it that, you know, they've got two mandates, inflation, um, you know, creating some inflation and having stable um, stable jobs market. And right now they're both kind of falling apart on the Fed. So you can see that, you know, it seems like a politically correct time to come in and say, ah, oh, you know what, we're changing horses here midstream. This isn't going perfectly. Let's get another leader in there and, you know, progress down that road and figure something out. So, you know, it's it's really I, I try not to keep the Fed in every trade that I do, Ash. You know, it's it's important to watch the price action and understand that the mechanism that what they're doing is causing all of this. Um, and we can only make moves to insulate ourselves against the failure or, um, you know, a continued policy that's going on the way it is, which can be looked at as a failure if we wind up with massive, massive energy inflation, food inflation, you know, a botched energy platform here in the U.S. I mean, there's a lot of risk involved with the plays that this administration is putting on the tape. So we're going to see how they pan out. But my sense is at some point things become politically unpalatable. And then when somebody starts making noise about all this, we'll see if the policy is so you know, jam the ESG movement on the tape, get to Glasgow with the 85 cars in the motorcade, and who cares what anybody says about it, it's happening. We'll see yeah. if they have to let off the gas on that, but right now it doesn't seem like they've got too much impetus to lay off the gas. I mean, they're having a big keg party over in Glasgow. Energy markets are higher. The stock market's higher. I mean, there's nobody running from what's going on right now. Yeah. Important points you just made right there. Talking of switching horses, uh, let's saddle up on some of these questions and jump on because we've got a lot of them coming to you. This one comes with uh, to us from Ringo from the exchange that's Real Vision's uh, internal social network. Uh, and the question is, 
During this whole commodities boom, Rio Tinto stock has nosedived. Is this all China exposure? What catalyst do they need to recover? This, of course, is the Australian uh, uh, metals and mining conglomerate. Yes, um, I would say that that is a direct reflection. I would imagine that if you uh, charted Rio straight up against iron ore, that you would see the commensurate pullback. You know, Rio just went from 130 to 90. Iron ore went from 1,200 won per metric ton to now 500 and something won per metric ton. So it has been properly cut in half by China. Part of it was first to cool off the inflation story. The second part would seem to me like their uh, slowdown in PMI, so an actual industrial slowdown, very slight, but there. And I think that's why uh, iron ore came sailing off the highs. I'm going to guess that's why Rio came sailing off the highs. Interesting analysis. By the way, I should say, apparently Rio Tinto is actually Anglo-Australian and it's headquartered in London, not in Sydney. Did not know that's that. right. They're, they're, yeah, I'm way behind the yeah, curve on that merger for sure. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, here's one that comes to us uh, from Bo Nito from the Real Vision site. Uh, could a highly leveraged bond market actually be the black swan hiding under our noses? That's interesting. You know, I can entertain that idea because I have, you know, written basically up on a post-it on my board there is that the risk to the stock market is a dislocation in the bond market. So, you know, if you if you look at the bond market as being excessively long or, you know, maybe maybe you can look at it as as we head into an inflationary environment, the idea of a 60-40 portfolio is all wrong, right? Because it should be 90% stocks and 10% bonds if bonds are going to get slaughtered with higher yields, right? So maybe there's something to that where maybe the world is, you know, long way too many treasury bonds for the way the market is going to perform over the next 10 years. I could definitely buy into that. Whether there's a kind of a retail crash or panic in the Treasury bond market, not I'm not going to handicap a high probability of that happening just because we've seen massively inflationary headline data and we've seen the bond market go, OK, yields a little bit higher, right? Yields a little bit higher. OK, yields a little bit higher. There's been no gasping three to five day heave in the bond market where yields move two percent in the front end right we're not seeing that kind of dislocation so in the absence of that i think it's business as usual but i do like your idea that maybe the world is a little bit long bonds for the amount of inflation slash higher yields that we could be set up for that makes a lot of sense to me yeah well said uh so tony a whole slew of uh cryptocurrency related current questions for you remain calm i'm remain over my head i'm over i'm over my head i'll admit that right away <laughs> Well, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the price action. Remain Calm just said, TG, talk BTC to me. Uh, and then he talks about a bunch of other cryptocurrencies and some other things. But how are you looking at this market now in terms of price action? What are your thoughts there as you look at it? You know, it, it was a huge month, obviously, in October for Bitcoin. Um, I wouldn't expect too many 42% months, right? We had, this, we had the backdrop of the ETF, um, the Bitcoin ETF market coming alive. Um, we have the backdrop of a lot of people, a lot of major players in the market are long Bitcoin and selling calls against it. What I'm hearing from inside the markets, they've got they're selling some upside strikes. So now as it gets to these strikes, some of the dealers are long and they're selling Bitcoin into it. I think that may be what's capping it right now. Um, but that's just some kind of under the uh, on the trading desk story that I've been getting. Um, so I think that's relevant to price action. Uh, the chart looks as good as it looks. To me, it still seems frothy with the Paul Tudor Jones comments, the 40% run up into the into the ETF launch, et cetera, et cetera. I know that some of that stuff is becoming commonplace for Bitcoin, but for me, who's trying to overlay old school macro tactics onto this new macro um, security, I would still rather see it, an orderly pullback here to its moving averages while everybody with laser eyes is high-fiving the fact that they have Paul Tudor Jones on their team. Um, Ash is going to the NFT fair in you know Times Square. You know what I mean? Like it's all very, very frothy in sentiment land right now. So I just want to try to outthink myself, stay a little bit long and buy a pullback to 54K, which seems totally reasonable to me. If it goes up without me, I won't be as long as I would like, but at least I'll have been there, which is more than I can say for my book, say, six months ago.
Yeah, extremely well said. I think it's important. And one of the things that we like to do at Real Vision is to bring these different perspectives from things. We'll get the laser eye analysis, but it's also great to hear you thinking about it from a macro perspective as a trader. Really interesting in terms of what the price action is telling you, because there's all kinds of data and then there's price. Uh, and price obviously uh, gets the final vote, doesn't it? Price and performance don't lie, Ash. That's how we set up the whole book and all of our strategies here. And um, it's made it's made my market ulcers go away, and it makes um, trading the markets much less emotional. Yeah. Hey, Tony, before we wrap here, can I tell you a little bit about this NFT conference? Let's go. I want to hear it. And it's such a fascinating space. The level of energy and enthusiasm here, I mentioned this a little bit at the top of the show, uh, From ultimately from, uh, from the end users and the end consumers of this content is very strong. It's really interesting. Quentin Tarantino made a speech today at this conference that showed up uh, at uh, the Palladium to give a surprise uh, speech talking about, uh, which was announced on CNBC about an hour earlier, uh, that they were going to be creating NFTs around Pulp Fiction, uh, deleted scenes, scenes that no one has ever seen before that's been in Quentin's basement uh, for the last 20 years, uh, original handwritten versions of the scripts. It's really interesting to me. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just, Ash, I love it because it, like, this you you're just explaining the argument to me that when people say to me like who's going to buy an nft like you know when you you know anybody could have the screenshot anybody could have this and i'm like i can look at him now and say who's not going to buy quentin tarantino pulp fiction nfts who's not going to be in a bidding war with somebody else for that cuz i'm ready to bid for that you know what i mean that's why i was shaking my head i'm like it's 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 the perfect you know, it's the perfect shiny disco ball to be a yeah. collectible item for the sure. cryptocurrency market. And if people want to know that they're the only one that owns the rights to this NFT, then I'm sorry, but that market is going to trade like May wheat. You know, it's so interesting. We're getting into this space here that it's it's a different type of space when we talk about just the human nature involved. Like you could say, for example, why would anyone buy a $1,500 Prada handbag when you could go down you know, to yeah. Canal Street and pick up one for 50 bucks that looks exactly the same. You're not talking necessarily about like this purely hyper rational view of the world, the way that you look at, you know, the way that you look at price action. There's something now that we're getting into, and this is what's so interesting to me about this space. It's about this kind of emotional connection to things that people feel as though they own themselves. It's really fascinating, and there's ample precedent from this. I'm always blown away when I look on Facebook and I see I have a couple of friends who are really into going to like Comic Con, right? And they go and they buy these like limited edition collectors dolls, and they get them signed by an actor who nobody's heard of uh, since 1978, who did some sci-fi film. It's really interesting to me, and it's starting to look a little bit like that. This idea of communities, of people choosing to self-associate, to identify with themselves with a larger community, to find a way of belonging to that community. There are all kinds of things there that are not just about the commodity value of a specific token. Oh man, this is a good Ash. I loved your your um, Fendi bag. Was that the analogy? The El Prada yeah, Fendi bag. Fendi Prada, you pick it. Yeah. No, but you know that's that's the perfect thing. You know, is we're seeing you know we're seeing um, stores of value change around us, right? In the markets, we're seeing um, pillars of authority sort of shift things are changing in society you know it's just getting a little bit different it would not shock me if these nfts replaced you know at some level that need to have that need to be you know i don't know the high fashion dollar right like are people going to spend you know i would not be shocked if the next generation you know my kids generation gen z looks at the world and says i don't want a prada i want the pulp fiction nft you know right. and that may become a cultural thing where none of them are wearing prada and next thing you know, there's no more Prada, but there is a store you can walk into and shop for NFTs on the screen, right? The one thing that I saw, like the sports NFT market is really intriguing Absolutely. to the point where they're showing some highlights from all different views. Have you seen this, Ash, where yeah. it's a, yeah. it's kind of a highlight NFT and it's like maybe one highlight, but it's like five or six different views in the stadium. And I look at that and I'm like, my God, if I was in my 20s and had some extra cash, I would have to own that for the sports plays that I wanted to own, you know? And so th there's just no way that I'm gonna fade this market at, on any level because it's the type of thing that I like to invest in. I think it's the type of thing that people in general, it makes them happy yeah. to invest in, to pursue, to trade, to follow a market for that, man. I like your idea that Profit might be a $10 bag in 10 years. Yeah, and who knows, maybe Prada has uh, an NFT where they start generating a lot of revenue there. I mean, look, we may exactly. wind up in a world where we buy 
$18 shirts on Amazon.com, but you spend $20,000 on an NFT. I understand why that would sound crazy. I get that. Yeah. I understand yeah. that. But also, you know, there are a lot of other trends. I know we're running out of time here, but I just wanted to touch on this point because there are a lot of underlying trends here that we talk about, like virtualization of the world. You and I have met in person twice, right? Twice, yeah. physically in person. And we talk to each other like we've known each other for years because we have this conversation every week. We have a virtual relationship. So why yeah. wouldn't we have virtual relationships with the things that we own? And by the way, we're the gray hairs on this now. People who are in their, you know, in their 20s and coming up behind them in their teens, they're natives of this virtualized landscape, natives of this virtualized world. So why wouldn't we see more things moving into this sort of virtual cyber crypto domain? Yeah, especially if the next generation sees that as moving away from, you know, legacy finance, legacy currency, legacy, all of it. So, you know, it's not really hard to have an open mind about this stuff. You know, as you really, you really, really got to put the blinders on um, and you, I, you can care what you want about where it ends up in value. Right. Man, if you want to live in this world today, your eyes better be wide open to what's going on because this stuff is coming on like wildfire, like literally like nothing I've ever seen before. And that's why that's why I can create so many trading scenarios where people come at me with some historical data and I could say, yeah, but this time it's different and I could prove it. You know, that's that I think is sort of an observable thing. You know, we never had this government. We never had the globe shut down the economy before. Right. Coming out of that, we never had a pivot away from fossil fuel before. Right. The whole world civilization was running on fossil fuel. Right. Dollar and a half gas is civilization. Dollar loaf of bread, that's civilization. A 50 cent cup of coffee, that's civilization. Five dollars for coffee, seven dollars at the pump. That's uncivilized. That's not taking the power of fossil fuel, harnessing it and using it to run your society. That's doing something that's more virtuous. Yeah. And it seems like something we're going to do anyway. So that's why the markets are as virile as they are. Yep. That really is the perfect note to end on. Who knows where this is going to end? But I think you're spot on about keeping an open mind. This doesn't seem stupid to me at all. No, no this is, uh, I mean, it's an extreme. We, we've had collectibles my entire life. I've been obsessed with them. And if this is the way collectibles are going, there's no way that I would expect that it's going to go flying back to, you know, hard assets and a signature that says this is Derek Jeter that signed this. Believe me. Right. Like, I doubt we're going back to that. So I like the way it's going. I love that you went to the um, to the NYC fair and got a flavor for it. And, keep you know, keep your nose in the game, Ash. We'll keep learning about this as we go. Yeah. And all we can say to that is more to come. Thanks so much for being with us, Tony. Great job, Slash. We'll see you next week. And thanks again to everyone for watching the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Tomorrow, it's Maggie Lake on with Darius Dale. And of course, the con conversation continues on the exchange. In the meantime, go check out all our latest videos on realvision.com. Thanks for watching, everyone. Uh...